And as they're making their way outside, why don't we go ahead and uh, raise up our Bible or your tablet or iPhone, whatever it is you use to study the Word of God, and we'll make our weekly declaration together. This is the Word of God. It is alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the Word of God abides forever. It's a lamp to my feet and a light into my path. It is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. I believe everything it says. I am who it says I am. I have what it says I have. And I can do what it says I can do. And everyone agreeing said, Amen. And amen. Well, again, if you are a guest with us this morning, we do want to welcome you. We have been going through a study out of the book of Judges that we've also tabbed as the book of heroes. And in our recent study through this book, we have been focusing on the life of a guy by the name of Gideon, who we saw went from a zero to a hero in the kingdom of God. God. And we saw that as a result of this, that God called forth Gideon to lead an army to go to war against the enemies of the nation of Israel. But we saw that as Gideon uh, assembled this army together from some of the various tribes of the nation of Israel, uh, there was about 32,000 of them, that uh, God had to uh, reverse the process. He, he actually had to begin a major downsizing project with them. And the reason why is because he knew their hearts and he told Gideon, no, there's too many of you here and you will take credit. You will become boastful. You will be proud when you defeat your enemies. And so I need to cut your army down to size. And so as a result of this, 22,000 men were removed because they did not have faith. They were fearful. They were trembling. Uh, and so God let them go. Then after that, there was another downside project and there was about 10,000 men who were removed because they did not have focus. So some were removed because they didn't have faith. Others were removed because they did not have focus. And so God whittled Gideon's army down to a mere 300 men who though small they all had faith and focus, two things which were needed to defeat the enemies of God. And so these 300 men, if you will, they were God's uh, green berets. You know, this is Veterans Day weekend. This is, you know, God's SEAL team. And we saw a few things in last week's study. One, we saw that sometimes, just like Gideon's army, God needs to cut us down to size. You see, loved ones, we can never be too small in God's eyes, but we can be too big. And big heads always cause big problems in God's economy. Second, we discover that bigger is not always better. Meaning, it's not how many people are following you, but rather what kind of people are surrounding you. God wanted the right kind of people to surround Gideon. You see, God is not impressed with numbers. Now, he's not opposed to them either. He, actually, there's a book in the Old Testament 
Testament called the book of Numbers. And so uh, it's not that they're inconsequential, it's just that God is not impressed with numbers. What God is most impressed with is hearts and minds that are fully devoted to Him. Third thing that we saw was the principle of pruning. And this is really what God is doing with Gideon's army. He is pruning them down to size. He is cutting away uh, unnecessary parts, if you will. And we talked about this, how in both the spiritual realm and the physical realm, pruning is both a natural and necessary process because even though it can look awkward at times, it is always for the purpose of God preparing us for a new season of fruitfulness. And that is exactly what is about to happen with Gideon and the children of Israel. Now, as we pick up in the latter part of chapter 7 in the book of Judges. If you haven't turned there yet, would you please do so? Judges is in your Old Testament. It's right after Joshua or right before uh, Ruth. Chapter 7. And what we see here in chapter 7 is that God reveals more of his plan to Gideon. And this is usually how it works. We know in part and we prophesy in part. And rarely does God give us the complete picture all at once. It usually comes in bits and pieces that as we walk in faith and as we walk in obedience further revelation and further direction is given for us to accomplish the assignment that God has placed before us. And so <clears throat> with that introduction Let's pick up this morning in chapter 7, beginning in verse 15. It says this, When Gideon heard the account of the dream and its interpretation, you may remember last week that God sent Gideon and uh, his servant Pura, his friend Pura, down to the camp of the uh, uh, enemy, and it was there that they heard a prophetic dream and its interpretation that gave Gideon the confirmation and and the confidence and the courage he needed to uh, follow through with this mandate that God has placed upon his life. So when he heard of the dream and its interpretation, he bowed in worship. And he returned to the camp of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord has given the camp of Midian into your hands. And he divided the 300 men into three companies, and he put trumpets and empty pitchers into the hands of all of them with torches <laughs> inside the pitchers. And he said to them, Look at me and do likewise. And behold, when I come to the outskirts of the camp, do as I do. When I and all who are with me blow the trumpet, then you also blow the trumpets all around the camp and say, For the Lord and for Gideon. And so Gideon and the hundred men who were with him came to the outskirts of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch. When they had just uh, posted the watch and they blew the trumpets and smashed the pitchers that were in their hands. And when three companies blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers, they held the torches in their hands and trumpets in their right hands for blowing and cried a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. And each stood in his place around the camp and all the army ran 
Jordan. This is 132,000 Midianites here. All of them ran, crying out as they fled. When they blew 300 trumpets, the Lord set the sword uh, of one against another, even throughout the whole army. And the army fled as far as Beth Shetah toward Zerah, as far as the edge of Ebel uh, Mahola by Tabith. And the men of Israel were summoned from Naphtali and Asher and all Manasseh, and they pursued Midian. And Gideon sent messengers throughout all the hill country of Ephraim, or Ephraim, saying, Come down against Midian and take the waters before them, so far as Bethbara and the Jordan. So all the men of Ephraim were summoned, and they took the waters as far as Bethbara and the Jordan, verse 25, and they captured the two leaders of Midian, uh, Oreb and Zeah, and they killed Oreb at the rock of Oreb, and they killed Zeah at the winepress of Zeah, while they pursued Midian, and they brought the heads of Oreb and Zeah to Gideon from across the Jordan. And so here is this story of how God uses 300 men who had focus and who had faith to defeat their enemies that uh, numbered 135,000 men. Now, it's quite likely that the men, because they arose from their sleep, they're in this deep slumber, and they arose from their sleep, and they look up, and they see all these 300 torches, most likely in their minds, they figured that each torch represented a company. <laughs> and so, in their minds, Minds, they're just not seeing 300 men. They're most likely seeing a, a, a company of thousands upon thousands of people. Now, the interesting thing that I want to point out about this story is I want you to notice how God wants Gideon's army to use four things. And the four things that he wants them to use is shields, and swords, and chariots, and catapults. No, that's not what he wanted them to use, was it? That must be another version of the Bible, right? He didn't tell them to use those things. All things, horses, and chariots, and swords, and shields, would make sense in the natural mind, right? But that is not what he called them to use. What he called them to use was trumpets, pitchers, voices, and torches. Those four things were the arsenal of Gideon's army of 300 men. Again, trumpets, pitchers, voices, and torches. And these are all unconventional weapons, aren't they? And we see here that oftentimes, hear this, oftentimes faith defies logic. Let me say that again. Oftentimes, faith defies logic. But I love this because we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, that the weapons of our warfare as believers are not carnal. In other words, they're not of the flesh, but rather they are divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. And we see here how God's wisdom and God's methods is oftentimes contrary to man's wisdom and man's methods. And God, of course, tells us this. <laughs> my thoughts are not your thoughts, and my ways are higher than your ways. Now, I want you to notice how <clears throat> three of these spiritual weapons... 
they revolve around the making of sound. And really, this is something that can be so easily overlooked in our study of God's Word. You see, they all used sound. And you see, loved ones, the sound of faith and the sound of obedience always, always, always draws God's attention. And the sound of faith, it always has a prophetic element that is attached to it. And yet, I have discovered that too often among God's people, we're not hearing the sound of faith. We're not hearing the sound of obedience, but rather what we are hearing is the sound of fear or criticism or gossip or disbelief or, or apathy. But you see, loved ones, there is a sound of heaven that is seeking to find its place on earth and overwhelm the various sounds of the flesh. And that's exactly what we see taking place here in Judges chapter 7. And, and really this theme of how God uses sound is seen all throughout the scriptures. For example, Adam and Eve heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And you see, what they heard was the sound of God's presence. You might remember the story about the walls of Jericho, right? And as the children of Israel encamp around this fortified city, the, 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 this wall that they had erected was, was massive. And it could not be penetrated in the natural. And the children of Israel realize this. And so what the Lord does is that he tells the children of Israel to march around the city, the walls, seven times in complete silence. Now that's a supernatural act right there. Right? That's a miracle in and of itself. Just try being being completely, absolutely silent for seven straight days. And you'll see what a miracle that is. And so they obey the Lord. And the, listen, the sound of silence can be a very powerful sound. And so they, in silence, they march around the walls of Jericho and on the seventh day, together as one man and with one voice, they let out this mighty shout that literally penetrated and caused the walls of Jericho to come tumbling down. And that shout, my friends, was the shout of faith. It was the shout of victory. We remember John the Baptist and how he was a voice of one crying out in the wilderness, issuing forth a prophetic sound of repentance to the nation. And John's voice was the sound of heaven coming to earth. On the day of Pentecost, they heard a sound like the blowing of a mighty rushing wind, which was, of course, the wind of the Spirit. And it was on that day that new life came forth and that the New Testament church was officially born as a result of this sound that came forth from the heavens. Another Old Testament example is when King David was to go to war on an, a, spe, a specific occasion that God told him, David, wait until you hear the sound of marching on the top of the balsam trees. I love that. Simply put, David, wait until you hear the sound of heaven. Because guys, listen. What we do here on earth should always, always, always be a reflection of what is taking place first in the heavens. And we have examples of all of this throughout the scriptures. And so here we, we see the sound of trumpets. 
We, we see the, the, the sound of voices. We see and we hear the sound of broken pitchers. And I love this because we see here the role of acoustics in the kingdom of God. And acoustics is the branch of physics concerned with the study of sound. And we've all seen this uh, where there are certain sounds that can break or shatter glass, right? There, there are sounds that can literally, they're so high, they can pierce your eardrums. There are sonic booms that can penetrate the atmosphere and cause vast destruction. Some sounds can comfort us. Some sounds can frighten us. Some uplift us. And the list goes on and on and on. And there's actually some sounds that they're so high that you and I cannot hear it, but animals can. And I believe that the same thing is true in the spirit realm. That there are sounds that issue forth that the enemy can hear that others may not be able to hear. But he knows when the church offers up the sound of faith. He knows when the church is offering up the sound of worship and the sound of obedience. And the amazing thing is that God created acoustics for many reasons, but one was to bless and to benefit His kingdom here on earth. Loved ones, think about it. Sound is a gift and tool of God if we use it for His glory. And just like sounds can be used in the natural to defeat an enemy, so too they can be used in the spiritual in our supernatural battle against the kingdom of darkness. You see, sound used for its proper purpose and its proper place for the glory of God can actually become a divine weapon of warfare in the life and the ministry of the church. Never, ever underestimate the sound of your prayers. Never, ever underestimate the sound of your praise. Never, ever underestimate the sound of your faith. Because you see, those things are going forth. And God is using them as weapons of warfare against the enemies of God. You see, preaching is the sound and the voice of heaven. Prophetic declarations are the promise of heaven. Clapping is the applause of heaven. Singing is the song of heaven. Shouting is the battle cry and the sound of the victory of heaven. And when, listen, when God's people come together as one man with one heart, one mind, and one voice, watch out. Because when that takes place, there is a shift that's going to occur that is going to have a powerful, powerful impact on the world around us. And that's why there should be much rejoicing and much sound in the life of God's people. Because, oh, how we desperately need that divine shift to take place in the church today so that it will take place in the world as well. And it brings up a very important question, and it's this. A question that we all need to ask ourselves. What sound are we making as a church? And what sound are we making as individuals? You see, unless it is the sound of heaven, we are actually partnering with a lesser kingdom that is focusing on lesser things. And as representatives of God's kingdom, we must make sure that we are always, always, always sounding forth the voice of heaven and the sound of heaven because anything less, my friends, will not advance the kingdom of God on earth. Now, 
I also want you to notice how one of the sounds was that of broken pitchers. And we're going to uh, spend some time focusing on this theme right now. Broken pitchers, because this is really a powerful picture of how God loves to use broken things. Let me say that again. This is a powerful picture of how God loves to use broken things. Regarding broken things, someone once wrote, <clears throat> Broken pitchers gave ample light for victory. Broken bread was more than enough to feed the hungry. A broken box of perfume gave fragrance to all the world. A broken hip gave Jacob a constant reminder of God's blessing. And a broken body became salvation to all who would believe and receive the Savior. Therefore, what cannot the one who was broken himself do with our broken plans and projects and hearts? I love that. You see, God delights in using broken things. And we see in this story, out of Judges chapter 7, the power of brokenness and how God's breaking of us is actually God's making of us. And we see that, listen, to the degree of our brokenness determines the degree of our blessing. Now, I want to say that again. We see that to the degree of our brokenness determines the degree of our blessedness. The blessing of victory was only found in the breaking of the pitcher. And guys, this, is, this story of broken pitchers is yet an Old Testament picture of a New Testament principle, and that is God loves to use broken things. Aren't you glad? What good news, what great news, what, what amazing and exciting news that is. Because this is a, an assembly of broken people. In Psalm 51, verses 16 and 17, it says this. Let's, let's read this out loud together, shall we? <laughs> let's begin. For you do not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. You are not pleased with burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. Loved ones, the breaking of our lives and our embracing of it will lead to blessing and breakthrough. But you see, often something has to first break before we can experience the blessing of breakthrough. Again, something first has to break in order to have the blessing of breakthrough. And we, of course, are familiar with Jesus at the Last Supper and how he broke the bread and he gave thanks. Now, this is profound. Think of this. Jesus was thanking the Father for the broken body and all its pain and suffering that he was about to experience. He was thanking the Father for his own breaking. We're so opposite. We usually resist being broken, don't we? We run from it. But guys, hear this. It's only as we can give thanks to God for the brokenness we are going through or we are about to experience that we become most like Jesus Christ. And that's what I love about Jesus. You see, Jesus, he, he, he never asked us to do something or be something that he wasn't willing to do or be himself. Never. 
Someone once said about this theme of brokenness, <laughs> they said there are a few indicators of a blessed church. And they are wet eyes, bent knees, and broken hearts. I love that. Someone else said that brokenness is what we allow God to make of us. Isn't that cool? And this is, again, what I love about Jesus. He was willing to be broken for us so that we would come to that place that we too are willing to be broken for Him and His purposes and His glory. During Jesus' ministry on earth, He said to the crowds, Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Basically, Jesus was calling the broken. He was calling the brokenhearted. He was calling those who are part of broken homes and broken families, broken dreams, broken hopes, and broken bodies. You see, loved ones, Jesus is a collector of broken things. That's why we're all here this morning. Hallelujah. He's a collector of broken things. Whereas we usually throw away broken things, that's not the case with Jesus. When it comes to broken things and broken people, Jesus is a hoarder. He wants as many as he can get. His heart is drawn toward the broken and the outcast, not the proud and the prominent. And so, we must embrace the brokenness that God wants to bring to our lives so that we too can be the type of army that He uses to advance His kingdom and bring Him glory here on the earth. Now I want you to notice <laughs> something else, and that is in verse 16. Let's read this again. It says that Gideon divided the 300 men <clears throat> into three companies, and he put trumpets and empty pitchers into the hands of all of them with torches inside the pitchers. And of course, as we read on in this, it says in verse 19, So Gideon and the hundred men who were with him came to the outskirts of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch when they had just posted the watch, and they blew the trumpets and smashed the pitchers that were in their hands, and then the others uh, follow in suit. And we see that in, the, in this breaking of pitchers, that a tremendous light from their torches began to shine forth. Notice that though it was only as the pitchers were broken that they could shine forth the light that was inside of them. And this once again illustrates how it's in our brokenness that the light of Christ shines most brightly. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. It says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. <laughs> There's a poem that I love. I've shared it with you a couple times over the eight plus years that I've been here. But it bears repeating this morning because it's so appropriate to today's message. And it's called The Vessel, and it goes like this. The master was searching for a vessel to use. On the shelf were many, which one would he choose? Take me, cried the gold one. I'm shiny and bright. I'm of great value, and I do things just right. My beauty and luster will outshine the rest, and for someone like you, Master, gold would be best. The Master passed on with no word at all. He looked at a silver urn, narrow and tall. All serve you, dear Master, all pour out your wine, and all be at your table whenever you dine. My lines are so graceful, my carving so true, and my silver will always compliment you. 
Unheeding, the master passed on to the brass. It was wide-mouthed and shallow and polished like glass. Hear, hear, cried the vessel. I know I will do. Place me on your table for all men to view. Look at me, called the goblet of crystal so clear. My transparency shows my content so dear. Though fragile am I, I will serve you with pride, and I'm sure I'll be happy in your house to abide. The master came next to a vessel of wood. Polished and carved, it solidly stood. You may use me, dear master, the wooden bowl said, but I'd rather you use me for fruit and not for bread. Then the master looked down and saw a vessel of clay, empty and broken, it helplessly lay. No hope had the vessel that the master might choose to cleanse, to make whole, to fill, and to use. Ah, this is the vessel I've been hoping to find. I will mend it, and I'll use it, and I'll make it all mine. I need not the vessel with pride of itself, nor the one who is narrow to sit on the shelf. Nor the one who is big-mouthed and shallow and loud. Nor the one who displays his content so proud. Not the one who thinks he can do things just right. But this plain, earthly vessel filled with my power and might. Then gently he lifted the vessel of clay. He mended it and cleansed it and he filled it that day. And he spoke to it kindly. There's work you must do. Just pour out to others what I pour into you. Powerful. May that be the theme and the cry of our hearts. Lord, break me so that I can be useful for your kingdom and for your glory. Less of me and more of you. Now, Look with me also in verse 21. It says this, And each stood in his place around the camp, and all the army ran, crying out as they fled. I love this in verse 21 as well. Notice it says that they each stood in their place. Loved ones, part of advancing God's kingdom and being successful in the things of God is learning not only to stand, but actually to stand in our place. Meaning this, we each have a place in the kingdom of God. But oftentimes, we, we desire to stand in someone else's place or take on someone else's position. But loved ones, we have to make sure that pride and selfish ambition never guides or governs our lives. We, listen, we need to stand wherever it is that God has placed us and not long for something else or someone else's ministry assignment. Let's be faithful to where God has placed and positioned us because it's so vital if we're going to play a part in what God is doing here on the earth. They stood in their place. And unfortunately, way too often, I have seen people abandon their place. I have seen people abandon their position because of frustration or offense or ambition or disappointment or any number of things that can cause us to go sideways or head in a wayward direction. And so, oh, all God's people, if each and every one of us would learn to stand in our place and let that be our focus and our faith. Now, in verse 20, and we'll close with this, 
I love what the Lord tells Gideon to say. After you've made the sound of heaven come to earth, I want you to say something out loud. I want you all to say it together. A sword for the Lord and for Gideon. It reminds me of C.S. Lewis and his book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and, and the battle cry for Narnia and for Aslan. And guys, this is a perfect picture of heaven partnering with earth. You see, this is how it should be. We shouldn't ask God to bless what we are doing. We should stand in the place that He has positioned us and bless what He is doing. A sword for the Lord and for Gideon. It is a picture of heaven partnering with earth and the result as we read was that the enemy became confused and eventually defeated themselves. Guys, let me tell you something. Unity is the synergy of heaven. Again, unity is the synergy of heaven. And when there is unity between heaven and earth, not even the gates of hell will be able to prevail against us. A sword for the Lord and for Gideon. God always comes first. But we must replicate and partner in what He is doing. Amen? Would you all stand with me? And I'm going to ask the prayer team and the elders to, to come forward and in a moment after we say this prayer. But let's pray this out loud together. One heart. One mind, one spirit, one purpose, and with one voice, let this be our prayer today. Let's begin. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is our prayer and this is our desire. Thank you that you are a collector of broken things and that in our brokenness our lights shine the brightest. Let us be a voice of heaven here on earth. Let us sound forth your praise, your power, and your purposes here on earth. We stand in this our victory. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit we pray. Amen and amen. Ask the prayer team to come forward. We're going to close in a song of worship to the Lord. But we also want to make a, available a time uh, for prayer. That should there be any here that needs prayer for anything, nothing too big, there's nothing too small. God cares about it all. And He can take care of it all the same. There's no big projects for God. There's projects that we have a big God that will take care of them, you see. And so, perhaps you're, you need healing of your body. Perhaps you're in the process of being broken. <laughs> and it's painful. You don't like it. You don't like the sound of it because there's a lot of crying going on. And it's you who's crying. There's a lot of pain that you're experiencing. You want someone to come and to pray over you. A prayer of love and comfort and strength and peace. Whatever it might be, God cares about it. And, and, and I encourage you to come and, and let it be lifted up to Him. And should you be here and you don't know this great God that we've been talking about today, Jesus came. God came from heaven to earth. And He was broken for you and for me. Think about it. 
And he wasn't only thankful for it or, or broken, he gave thanks for it as well. Knowing the suffering of the cross and the pain. It's how much he loves you. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Best deal ever. Best, best deal ever. And I want to encourage you to understand that there is no purpose in life without the creator of life. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. You see, He is the creator of heaven and earth. He is our creator, God. And if you want life, it can only be found in Him and through Him. I want to encourage you to come. And if you've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ, today's the day to do it. Today's the day of salvation. Why wait? Why wait? God bless you guys. Let's continue to embrace God's breaking of us. Amen? Amen.
of us, God, and all of us together, Lord. We thank you that our sound is powerful, Lord, and I pray that you would remind us of that and that you'd help us to make uh, a powerful sound, help us to agree with heaven, God, to agree with what you see, to agree with your heart, Lord. So I pray that you bless each and every one of us today. Um, we thank you for the word spoken today, Lord, and I pray that it would take root in our hearts, Lord and that it would bear fruit throughout the week and then from there, Lord. We just thank you, Jesus, for being with us and ask that you would help us to walk with you this week, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 